Pacific Island Fisheries observers independently collect data and information from tuna fishing vessels that harvest tuna in their country's exclusive economic zones. They monitor the fishing vessel's activity and catch. The valuable information and data they collect are used by fisheries scientists and managers to monitor and manage tuna fisheries in the western and central Pacific Ocean. Fisheries observers can spend up to a month, sometimes more, on board a tuna boat on a single trip. Tuna provides a vital source of food, employment, recreation, trade and economic well-being for Pacific Island people. For some Pacific Island nations, the tuna resources within their 200-mile exclusive economic zones represent their only significant renewable resource and their best opportunity for economic development. More than half of the global tuna catch comes from the Western and Central Pacific Ocean. In 2007, the total value of the catch from this area was 3.8 billion US dollars, and it continues to rise. Three quarters of the catch is from the Persane fishery, which provides tuna for canning in regional and southeastern Asian canneries. The Persane fishery targets skipjack tuna, but also records significant catches of juvenile yellowfin and big-eye tuna. There are nearly 300 super Persaners and thousands of longliners that fish in Pacific Island exclusive economic zones. For the past decade, the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, or SPC, together with the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency, or FFA, have been responsible for the training of Pacific Island fisheries observers in SPC and FFA member countries. Papua New Guinea runs one of the largest observer programs in the Pacific Islands, with around 200 national observers employed under contract with its National Fisheries Authority. Driving factor that is causing us to be able to focus a bit more in training uh, in recent times is the fact that the, the Tuna Commission has come up with a 100% observer coverage, a compulsory 100% observer coverage on all Persainas and eventually might extend to uh, longliners as well. So that has prompted us to uh, focus a bit more on training. Um, so that is why we established the training program in uh, KVN, the National Fisheries College, to, to train over a period of time, uh, observers that would be able to fulfill the 100% coverage level on an annual basis. Other countries, like the Federated States of Micronesia, Kiribati, Marshall Islands, Nauru, Solomon Islands, and Tuvalu run their own national programs. On the other hand, countries like Fiji, New Caledonia, French Polynesia, Samoa, Tonga, Niue, Tokelau, and Cook Islands have small national observer programs to monitor their tuna longline fleets. FFA, based in Honiara, Solomon Islands, administers the two sub-regional observer programs for FFA member countries. Our story begins in Papua New Guinea's national capital, Port Moresby. The coordination of all observer placements and observer administration takes place here at the office of the National Fisheries Authority. Two fisheries observers have just returned from a long trip to sea. They are going through a debriefing process where the data and information they collected are checked, verified and corrected. Debriefing is an important process that helps guarantee the quality of the data that observers collect. Debriefings address any queries the observers have and any critical incidents they may have encountered during their trip at sea. Observers go out to sea, come back, they need to be debriefed by senior observers or experienced observers. So the first, first and foremost is to guide them in terms of whatever they have learned from the classroom and to be able to see where the, the gaps are, the weaknesses are, so that it gives the observer opportunity to, to correct uh, themselves in terms of 
um, data that they collect. We have debriefers in ports, in, 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 in those six ports throughout the country where when we get observers coming through, they subject to these debriefing processes so that we can be able to, in the first instance, can be able to get information in relation to compliance issues. If there are any reports of non-compliance, that is re reported in the first instance and uh, passed over for follow-up investigations or enforcement um, actions to, to follow, or other issues that may be in terms of data quality and other information that is uh, relevant to uh, correct the, the observers at that point. At the same time, several observers are preparing to be deployed at sea. Observer Iamo Airi is one of them. His trip has been organized with Frabel PNG Limited, which is part of the Philippine Frabel Group. Frabel PNG has both a processing factory and a sea fishing base in the port of Ley. The fleet operates in the PNG fishing zone outside the 12 mile zone. Ley is the second largest city in Papua New Guinea and is located an hour's flight to the north of Port Mosby. On Tuesday, after spending a night in Ley, Iamo boards a small fiberglass boat which will take him to a fish carrier. He will travel for three days on the fish carrier before boarding his vessel at sea. His assigned vessel is Alpine Rose, currently fishing just below the equator and at 144 degrees east longitude. On his way to Alpine Rose, his vessel collects fish from other persinas for Fabel. Loins, sashimi and canned tuna are sold in the local PNG market and in Europe. Iamo is no stranger to observer work. I joined the Fisheries Observer Program in August 1998 up until today as we speak. I am also a debriefer and a senior observer. Well, apart from the domestic foreign owned, uh, I have been, I, I also observed the American Pesainers, the Taiwanese Pesainers, the Korean and uh, the Japanese Pesainers who have just joined the, formed an association and, join, and been fishing in the Pacific. Language has always been a barrier between the observers and the, and the, and the vessel operators on which flag vessel you're on. So <clears throat> the only way you can approach this problem is first settle in and assess the situation and come up with a sort of a system where on how you can communicate with the vessel operators, especially the captain or the radio operator or the, or the navigator on board. If someone speaks at least a little bit of English, then that would be your point of contact for the duration of the trip and for collecting your data. Iyamo boarded Alpine Rose on Friday morning around 1100 hours. Right here. Although normally there's only one observer per vessel, Iyamo will spend the next two weeks on board together with Ameke Tofu, another observer. Ameke has been working as an observer for just over a year. Uh, I'm a PNG NFA observer based in Lay now. I've been taking a patient trip for one and a half years now. Uh, my job is to monitor the fishing vessel, uh, the whole operation of the trip, uh, the compliance, the MAPOL regulation, all this, I will, I will monitor all these things. And, uh, this vessel I've been on for 11 days only now. Uh, instruction from the office, I will stay for 40 days, and then the new one will replace me. Iyamo does not waste any time and gets straight to work. The first set is carried out on Friday afternoon at 1500 hours. It is an unsuccessful set on a free school of tuna. The entire school escapes. It takes almost three hours to deploy the net and gear and then bring it back on board and get it stacked and ready for the next set. Free school is, uh, it is easy for me to set my net because 
You see the fish visually. Okay? You see the fish visually. You see the movement. And it is easy for me. And uh, one thing is, the size of fish is very big, not compared to payao. My equipment is uh, very uh, effective, especially the sonar, bird's radar, and all, all the equipment I have is very, very important for me, for fishing. An observer keeps a record of the vessel's daily activity. He or she also records any sightings of other vessels in the vicinity. The next day, the crew are up early. As is the observer. It is just after 6 in the morning on Saturday. This is where we are right now. The observer records his first position for the day. A free school of tuna is investigated. The captain decides to let go of the net skiff and the set begins. The vessel lays out its net to encircle the school. It takes 8 minutes to deploy the entire net. A helicopter and speedboat are used to assist in keeping the school inside the net while the bottom of the net is closing. At this stage, the captain and crew try to close the bottom of the net as quickly as they can. The school can either dive underneath the net or escape under the vessel. Pursing of the bottom cables usually begins when the cable is released from the net skiff, allowing the winch to purse both bottom ends of the net. It takes 30 to 35 minutes for the bottom of the net to draw closed before the rings appear at the surface. The net is now closed and the school of tuna is trapped inside. It takes an hour and 20 minutes to bring the 1,300 meter net back onto the stern using the hydraulic power block and to systematically stack it so it is ready for the next set. The next stage is sacking a process that requires enormous care. The heavy sack webbing is slowly, evenly hauled to bring the catch up from the net, which reaches a depth of 200 meters. It takes about an hour to carry out the sacking process, depending on how much fish is in the sack. At the end of the sacking process, the catch is exposed. It is time to braille the fish from the sack into the vessel hatch and the fish well below on the wet deck. The brailing process begins when the first braille is brought on board. The observer keeps a count of the total number of brails that come on board. He also estimates the fullness of each braille. He randomly collects five fish from each braille and is careful not to select a fish due to its size or because it's easier to handle. The sampling protocol calls for sampling to be spread throughout the entire brailing process to get a sound representation of the total catch. 17 brails have come on board. Their fullness range from a quarter full to completely full. The last braille brought on board marks the end of brailing process. The observer also estimates the amount of fish left in the sack that is later brought on board. At the end of brailing, the observer tallies all the brails that come on board and calculates the total number of full brails. The capacity of a full braille is estimated to be 6 metric tons. The observer estimates the set's total at 98 metric tons. A persena can deploy its net up to four times a day between early morning and late in the afternoon when fishing on free schools of tuna. Another set is made on a free school, but it is unsuccessful. Other persena vessels may make at least one set a day, usually early in the morning, if they fish on fish aggregating devices or floating objects. Fish aggregating devices are man-made objects either anchored to the ocean floor or drifting on its surface. Tuna are known to associate with floating objects. On Sunday, they make another set on a free school that looks quite big, but all of the fish escape between the tow line and the catcher. The second set of the day is made on a free school. Again, most of the fish escape. Around two tons of skipjack are retained. 
So the main thing for you to know is the four, four or five things you need to... The observer keeps a lookout for tag tuna, which are often found by crew and fishermen. The observer also collects otoliths, or ear bones, from tuna while they are out at sea. Okay. And then it's important that you fill up all the form. So giving us the tag like this without any information is not... At the end of the day, is not very useful to us. On Monday, several schools of tuna are investigated, but conditions are not right to deploy the net. The whole day is spent searching for free schools and floating objects. Living on board a fishing vessel can be challenging. An observer must adjust to the conditions on board. Observers are given a place on board and often live together with the crew and eat the same food as everyone else on board. Cooking a breakfast in the morning at 6 o'clock, 11 o'clock lunch, afternoon at 5 o'clock. Sometimes we're cooking a beef, steak, a soup, another uh, plenty of cooking the style of Italian style uh, cooking. I've been looking for probably for almost uh, three years now. Uh, it's more uh, meaningful, more strange, and more adventure uh, events here, uh, unlike in the land. So here I enjoy it. That's the, correct the observer continues to record the activity of the vessel for the rest of the day. He communicates with officers on board to collect all the information required to complete his data form. Okay, it's all done. On Tuesday, the observer and the crew are up before sunrise. A school of tuna is sighted. After consulting with the captain, we find that the school of tuna is associated with an anchored fish aggregating device. The captain ordered his towboats to perform spraying and towing before he lets go of the net skiff to deploy the net. It is a successful set with 60 metric tons of tuna brailed on board. The observer also collects other information such as biological samples of fish stomach, muscle tissue and liver. The stomach samples have to go through a fairly comprehensive process of sorting, identifying, weighing and recording of each species in the stomach content. The data are then transferred to a computer database. It is Wednesday and the captain and crew need 130 tons of tuna to fill the vessel's fish wells before heading back to port to unload. Since we boarded the vessel six days ago, it has caught over 300 tons of tuna. The vessel's total fish storage capacity is 650 tons. Four more sets are made, all unsuccessful. All four are made on free schools that are feeding on small bait fish or swimming unassociated. The captain decides to head back to Rabal to unload the vessel's 520 tons of tuna, mainly skipjack. The crew goes through a cleanup process to properly dispose of rubbish prior to arrival in Rabal. After two days of travel to reach Rabal, Iyamo and the team leave the boat. Iyamo has to go back to the office and complete the form and trip report for his short observer trip. He will participate in a debriefing process and his data will be sent to SBC. Ameka's job is not done yet. He still has over three more weeks at sea to complete his 40 days. But for now, he's taking a day off at Rabal Town, relaxing while the vessel is unloaded. The information and data collected by observers are confidential. And at the end of the trip, they are handed over to the National Fisheries Authority after checking and debriefing. A copy of the data is also sent to the Oceanic Fisheries Program at SBC headquarters in New Mayer, New Caledonia. The data is entered into the Observer database by SBC staff. Data and information collected by observers are used and translated into valuable scientific information, summaries, findings and reports by many scientists from SPC and around the world. There's a, there's a this information answers many varied questions 
asked by fisheries managers throughout the WCPO. Observers will continue to play a key role as the eyes and ears of fisheries and nations. Um, <laughs> skills and training of observers, the perfect observers. Observers need many and varied skills, in particular they need technical skills. They need knowledge of navigation, they need to be very good at data collection, they need data collection skills. They need knowledge of fish biology, of fishing gear and equipment, different types of fisheries. They be able to, need to be able to collect biological samples and they have to have knowledge of fisheries regulations and be able to write reports. They must have good maths and communication skills. They need to be alert, aware, healthy, both physically and mentally while on board. They also need to be able to work effectively amongst crew on board. So they need similar skills to what the crew have. And they need to be able to work with those crew um, should there be at sea emergencies. So we also give observers training in, in sea safety, uh, firefighting skills at sea, uh, communications at sea, uh, radio and other electronics communication skills, and first aid training. Apart from the more obvious technical skills, observers, observers also have to have have special attributes and skills. They need to be prepared to spend long time away from home. They need to be able to work in harsh environments, sometimes in harsh weather at sea, sometimes in just harsh living conditions. They need to be able to work with people from different cultures, different countries. They, they're often, they're normal, normally always the odd man out in the team. And uh, they sometimes have to work in hostile environments. Officers and crew of vessels often resent the presence of an observer because he takes away from space and food from the rest of the team that are working hard to catch more fish. And perhaps they're suspicious of an observer because he might collect information that will get them into trouble or some of the information he produces might help to restrict further fishing, future fishing activities. When an observer leaves training, there's, there's not many jobs we, that expect a, a, a new, newly recruited trainee to leave training and go to his job for an extended period with no supervision whatsoever. And this is what the observer does. He goes to sea, he doesn't, um, he doesn't have any recourse to a supervisor. If things aren't going right, if he doesn't understand something, he can't turn to anybody to ask. There's no colleagues around him that have done this job before. He's completely on his own. Many observer programs around the region, around the world rather, uh, use only marine biology graduates. PERFO observers, on the other hand, we, we don't expect our trainees to have that level of qualification to enter the process. And in fact, we believe that a well-selected uh, trainee, somebody that's enthusiastic about the job, who's, who's properly trained with well-designed uh, or too well-designed training standards, Will, will make a, as good as, if not better, observer than many um, marine biology graduates and is likely to stick around longer also. Highly migratory tuna need region-wide cooperation uh, to be effectively researched and managed. Hence, several observer programs from around the FFA and SPC region contribute data for scientists and managers to utilize. It is important that this data is consistent 
and that the quality of this data is consistent. And so it's important that the training is consistent. Realising this, FFA and SPC, uh, with some help from National Fisheries Authority of Papua New Guinea, and with input from fisheries observer coordinators around the region, in 2008 sat down and developed the Pacific Island Region's Fisheries Observer Certification and Training Standards. And it's these standards that fisheries observers are being trained to now. Consistent standards that, will, that can be used anywhere around the region that will give us the confidence that the observers that come out of that training will all provide consistent data. There are many purposes for debriefing, but one of the most important is ongoing training for observers. Debriefers who are, are specially trained, very experienced observers, sit down with observers on return from their trip to systematically go through the data. Their job is to help the observer recover data, improve the quality of the data that he has there, but perhaps even more importantly is to give the observer feedback for future trips so that in future the observer will produce consistently good data. This is also an opportunity for further training of an observer if new protocols and new, uh, new requirements are being put in place. Apart from debriefing, occasionally there is refresher courses that observers are asked to attend. Usually this will come about if there's been a, a review of data collection forms or if there's some major new a requirement that has come out that observers need to respond to. PERFA, Pacific Island Region Fisheries Observer. It was a uh, title that was first um, used to describe the certification and training uh, standards that were developed for, for FFA and SPC members. So I'm just going to explain a little bit about what SPC and FFA's roles are in, in uh, supporting observer work around the region. And, and essentially, uh, let me start with FFA, because FFA manages two observer programs in their own right, the two what are termed the sub-regional observer programs, one that works um, through a treaty between Pacific Island countries and the United States, the USMLT, and the other one is the FSM Arrangement Observer Program, which is modelled a lot on the original US Treaty Program, but is working for FFA member countries that have per se vessels flagged in their countries, and other fishing vessels, I expect. Um, SPC, on the other hand, they provide scientific and technical services to all their member countries. Uh, all of the FFA members are members of SPC also. And between FSPC, the Oceanic Fisheries Program, and FFA, we endeavour to provide support services to, to, uh, to our member countries to help them develop better observer programs. The primary, primary service we offer is training, and for that purpose we've, we've uh, developed the PERFO certification and training standards. As I mentioned before, FFA also manages observer programs. Uh, all SPC and FFA members are also members of the WCPFC, the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, which has a regional observer program, commonly referred to as the ROP. Now that regional observer program does not have its own observers, but uses observers from the programs of its member countries and from the sub-regional programs that we talked about before. What the Commission does, however, is it sets a number of rules and regulations that its members have a duty to provide um, and to, to meet. And part of those requirements are to provide information to the Commission that can be used for better fisheries management. So we have to ensure that all our observer programs will provide the data that the Commission requires to the standard that the Commission requires. So that the Commission asserts certain standards in place and all the observer programs that we support now um, have to provide data to meet those standards. That doesn't mean that that's all that the national programs do, but that certainly has been a primary, become a primary concern of national programs, is to make sure that they, they, they meet their obligations to the Commission. Each country might have extra duties that it wants its observers to do, 
and those tend to be few because the Commission's demands are, are, are fairly, um, what's the word, demanding. The, commission's, the, the Commission asks for a lot of information and, and this covers most of the National Program's needs anyway. The SPC Oceanic Fisheries Program began the Pacific Tuna Tagging Program back in 2006. It's um, a medium term project for us, quite high priority and its focus is on um, collecting information that is of uh, high importance for the ongoing stock assessment of the main tropical tuna stocks of skipjack, yellowfin and big eye tuna in the region. Um, the idea of these tagging experiments is to establish an experimental population, as it were, of tagged fish that we're able to monitor over time through recaptures from the fishery. And this provides uh, important information on the way these fish move, uh, the extent and rates at which they grow, and importantly, their exploitation rates and uh, the rates at which they die from natural causes um, in, in nature. And we're able to take all of this information and data and integrate it into our stock assessments and uh, hopefully improve them, make them more accurate and, and give better estimates of, of use for fisheries management. Um, so the, the tagging work began in Papua New Guinea in 2006 and we spent uh, uh, around six months of uh, the initial part of the project working in Papua New Guinea and as additional funding became available we moved on into the Solomon Islands and subsequently more widely into the Western and Central Pacific. Um, and at this point now we have operated over a very wide area of the Western and Central Pacific from Indonesia and Philippines in the west all the way over to the Lion Islands of Kiribati in the east um, using a couple of different methods. Uh, the main one based on pole and line fishing and uh, a second uh, method that's proved particularly effective in the Central Pacific for tagging big eye tuna is based on uh, hand lining uh, tuna aggregated underneath uh, oceanographic moorings. Um, that, that occur throughout the equatorial area. Uh, in 2011 we'll be beginning um, essentially a new uh, phase of this project again dedicated uh, to work in PNG on this occasion. Um, that work whilst contributing to the overall regional uh, objectives of the program uh, is also uh, aimed at providing quite specific and detailed information for PNG in the management of its tuna fisheries. So um, we'll be working with the National Fisheries Authority of PNG very closely in all aspects of this work from the, the field work, the management of the recapture process and the, and the recovery of tags through to the analysis and the formulation of all of that in, in a way that's useful for management of tuna fisheries in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, at the same time we're, we're also hoping that uh, there will be spin-off benefits for PNG in terms of capacity building uh, bringing on their staff in terms of how to manage these sorts of large field programs from uh, you know the planning stage through the implementation of field work uh, collection of data and the analysis of that data so in the long term we hope that um, NFA in, in PNG will be able to uh, uh, eventually um, run these sorts of programs themselves. Um, in the longer term still we hope to continue this uh, tagging program as a key element of our overall tuna stock assessment program. It provides really um, very, very critical information for ongoing assessments and it's going to be very helpful to have a continuous stream of this data over time. So um, that's the, 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 the real um, driving objective that we have now is to continue this program for the long term and of course uh, the observers um, that are out on fishing vessels, particularly Persane vessels with 100% coverage these days are, are a very important part of the, the overall tag recovery effort for the program. Observers collect uh, a large range of biological samples. Uh, some of the most important are fish ear bones which are known as odoliths. Uh, we use these to age the fish and if you look down the microscope you can see here that these odoliths uh, have a, a structure on them that's not too dissimilar to looking at the 
uh, a tree uh, cross section and you can see a number of rings that are along the cross section of the, the otolith. Uh, so when we shave down the otolith we can see these rings and then if we count those rings they often correspond to either yearly growth increments or daily growth increments and that way we can determine the age of the fish and this is really important information for stock assessment and general fisheries management. By being able to age the fish, we're able to determine the proportion of fish that are at various ages in the fish population, and that allows us to determine the growth rates, the mortality rates, which are really critical to determining the sustainability of uh, the various tuna stocks. Um, SPC at present has two uh, odoliff collection programs one focusing on South Pacific albacore and in particular the question that we're looking at there is differences in the age structure and growth rate between uh, albacore caught in the west around Australia and those caught uh, around French Polynesia. There's strong evidence to suggest in the length frequency information that observers collect that there are different growth rates between the two and the otoliths are our way of being able to confirm that. We also have a, a program looking at big eye and yellowfin growth rates. And this is concentrating in the equatorial uh, uh, Western and Central Pacific with a real focus at the moment on the Micronesia area of Palau, Federated States of Micronesia and the Marshall Islands. And this area is really important in that the, the large fish that are being caught by the longliners are at such a plentiful level that again it suggests to us that there could be different growth rates going on in this region. And so the collection of otoliths from both small and large fish from this region is really, really important. A second area of, of work that observers are often collecting for us are gonads, and these are the, the sexual organs of tuna, and again we're asking these to be collected uh, from both uh, albacore, uh, big eye, and yellowfin tunas. This information is really important for us because the gonads allow us to, particularly if we get size information as well, we're able to determine the age that the, and, and the size of the fish when they first become sexually mature. And we're also able to turn out, to work out how often the, the fish spawn. And this is again really, really important from a, a stock assessment perspective because we're able to determine then the reproductive functions that are used to model the population so we can determine what the status of the stocks are. On Persane vessels, uh, observers are normally able to, to sample the tuna at some point on the vessel. Um, typically we like them to be sampled fresh, makes it easy, uh, and the gonads then uh, are immediately frozen to preserve them. On longline vessels, the fish are typically gilled and gutted uh, at sea by the crew, and what we typically ask is that the observers collect the gonads uh, during that gill and gutting process. Often we also want the otolith to be collected uh, from the same individual, and many of the longline vessels within their operations, it's not feasible to allow the odalis to be extracted on the vessel and they need to be extracted back in port. And so what we ask observers to do in this case is to, we will provide them with this um, zip tag. And the idea is after gill and gutting, this is just placed through the, the, the loop of the, uh, this loop is placed through the mouth of the tuna to hold it in place, it has a unique number on here. And then for the gonad, we just rip one of these tags off and that's placed in the bag with the gonad. Again, placed in a freezer so that it's frozen. And then when we get back in port, we're able to relate that particular gonad with that tag number through to the fish that has this cable tie on its lip. And then we're able to extract the, the, the gonad. It has a range of other tags on here too, because often uh, we ask, if observers can also collect stomach samples, uh, liver samples, and sometimes even muscle tissue. And in that way, with each of these, we're able to ensure that if those samples go into different bags, they all have this tag number on them so we can relate them back to the fish if we need to extract the odolith back in port. Observers may also, uh, through their work, come across tagged fish, SPC, has been implementing large uh, a large-scale program of tuna tagging for the last four years uh, across the western uh, and central equatorial Pacific. In most cases, they'll see a fish that has a yellow uh, 
uh, external tag. This extends out of the um, dorsal fin area, has a unique number on it. If the observer sees it, we encourage them to take the details. It has a tag number at this end and also at this end. Uh, we encourage them to record the tag number, the location of capture and the date of capture if they can, and if possible, the, the, you know, the length of the fish given that they've got uh, suitable measuring equipment uh, with them. They may also come across an orange tag that extends out of the, the, the dorsal fin too, and that's an indicator that the fish could either have one of these two tags. And these are archival tags that uh, record temperature, uh, light, uh, and depth information constantly. And when we, when we receive these tags back, we can download them and uh, uh, with various analyses determine the daily movement patterns of the fish, both in terms of a horizontal direction and in a vertical direction. There's two types used. One's these large tags like these, sometimes that look like that, or a much smaller tag with a more flexible aerial. In both cases, the observer, having noted these orange tags, should be able to look to the stomach cavity and see these two uh, probes external to the, to the fish. Um, observers may also ob observe another type of uh, archival tag. This one is attached externally to the fish, typically uh, the attachment and our intent with these tags is after a period of time it detaches, floats to the surface and transmits the data uh, to a satellite. But of course on some occasions the fish may be caught before the date we've programmed the tag to uh, detach and float to the surface. If observers do find tags like this we encourage them to uh, remove the tag and organise for them to be sent back to SPC as soon as possible. Um, the return of uh, Tagging information for us by observers is critical to the program. Um, the most important information that we can get and is that the, t that the fish and has been captured and so the best way we can have that is by the observer recording the tag number. Um, but to make that uh, data ideally uh, usable for stock assessment in every capacity, plus other fisheries management applications, it's also really important for us to have the location of capture and the date of capture. In addition to that, if we can have the length of fish too, it allows us to uh, determine growth rates um, of, of each particular species, which again is particularly important for stock assessment. Uh, to make life easy, if you do come across a a tag on a fish whilst at sea. Um, in your observer workbook there is a, a section that has a number of tag recovery uh, forms in them. If you could simply uh, fill those in with all of the recovery details we'd be most appreciative. So the, the observers of the, of the region have been uh, helping us um, collecting samples for more than 10 years now. So they are collecting uh, just for us um, stomach, muscle and liver samples to conduct an ecosystem study of the, of the whole uh, Western and Central Pacific Ocean. So um, collecting the stomachs participates uh, greatly in this study and it's really the core of the study because it gives us information on, on the interactions between species. So as we all know, uh, tuna is the main species of interest in the Pacific for the fisheries, but uh, they are not isolated into, uh, into the ocean and they are uh, interacting with other living creatures such as uh, squids, other fish, crustaceans. And uh, it's important for us to, to know how they're interacting. And and the main way they are interacting is by eating each other and by eat, being eaten. So uh, collecting the stomachs and analyzing their content tells us about who eats who and uh, gives us a better understanding of, of the, the way the ecosystem functions. Um, and so all the information collected from the diet studies are included into uh, complex ecosystem models that are used for uh, management advice. 
So for example, we can try and, and look at the impact uh, of, for example, uh, closing the fad fisheries, so the fish aggregating um, device fisheries. Uh, if we close them, what will be the impact on tuna, but also on other bycatch species? So by uh, having those models, including the diet data, we can try and have information about that. So it's, uh, the, the stomach data is really an important uh, part of the work, and uh, we already uh, realized some new uh, discoveries. And for example, skipjack appears to be a very major player in the ecosystem. So we, we all know that skipjack is the main tuna species caught in the Pacific, but we also realize, uh, looking at the stomach content, that it's, it's one of the major food resources for all the species. Including skipjack, there is a lot of cannibalism, but also other tunas, uh, sharks, and uh, dolphin fish, wahoo, etc. All, basically all the top predators are feeding on, on small skipjack, less than 10 centimeter. And it's really a major um, um, food source into the ecosystem. And it's, it's really structuring the way the ecosystem functions. So we also realize that uh, a lot of top predators are feeding on uh, fish larvae especially uh, all those small um, larvae from reef fish and lagoon fish. So those reef fish are spawning and the small larvae are drifting into the ocean and they are growing into the ocean before coming back to the reef. But when they are growing into the open ocean, that's when they are eaten by the top predators, such as tunas. And for example, the latest study showed that in PNG, there's a uh, up to one-fifth of, of the daily ration uh, eaten by the tuna is composed of those uh, fish larvae. So trigger fish, um, also mantis shrimp. We explain this important uh, um, portion of larvae into the stomachs from PNG because it's, it's an area which is very complex with a lot of different islands and so many, uh, many reefs that are producing a lot of larvae. And also because there are many fads into the Bismarck Sea, particularly. And so the small larvae are coming uh, under the fads and as a shelter, but actually they are eaten by, by the top predators. So those are some of the findings from our studies. Uh, observers are also asked to collect uh, muscle and liver. And those tissue sampling are used in different ways. Um, one of the studies that are sometimes conducted is uh, genetics. So we're collecting samples from different regions for the same species and we look at the genetic and comparing the genetic between the different regions. And it will tell us if the stocks, if, if the fish from those different regions are from the same stock. That is, if they're mixing, if they're um, uh, evolving into the same area. So if the genetics are identical, it means that the fish are from the same uh, stock, the same population. If the genetics are different, they are from two different populations and they should be uh, managed differently, separately. So it's important for management. Another, um, another study conducted based on the uh, on the muscle tissues collected by the observers is the isotope studies. So isotopes are chemical elements that are inside, uh, inside the muscles but are basically everywhere. So they are in the water and they are um, consumed by the phytoplankton, so the small algae at the base of the food chain. And the phytoplankton is consumed by zooplankton, which is consumed by small fish, large fish, and top predators. And the isotope that was in the water and goes into the food chain through the phytoplankton will travel up the food chain. And while it travels up the food chain, it's accumulating. So um, phytoplankton will have very low levels of uh, isotopes, but when we are going along the food chain, it accumulates, and at the top of the chain, the level of isotope is really high. So what 
the, this tells us is that where is the fish we are looking at in, in the food chain. So with a high level, it's a really top predator. With a low level of uh, isotope, it's a, a small uh, predator. So, and for example, one of the findings we have is that we usually believe that uh, big guy are at the top of the food chain, and then we've got yellowfin and skipjack, just to talk about those three. But we actually discovered in some regions we've got, yes, so big eye at the top, but yellowfin and skipjack are actually at the same level. So it helps us with the diet from the stomach content to have a better understanding of uh, how the ecosystem functions. Isotop also gives us an idea of uh, the origin and the movement of the fish. And we, uh, we realize that, for example, in PNG, the level of isotope in the water is really low, while uh, at the other side, in French Polynesia, it's really high. So we've got a difference between those two regions in the isotope in the water. Then it's consumed by the phytoplankton, it's consumed by zooplankton, small fish, and big fish. So it, ac it still accumulates the same way in the food chains, but because in PNG we started low and in French Polynesia we started high, we still have this difference in the tunas. And so we know that low uh, isotope tunas are from PNG and high isotope tunas are from French Polynesia. So it gives us indication uh, on the origin of the fish and potentially on the movement. So it's, it's another way to, uh, to try and have information on the movements of the fish. And it really acts like a, a chemical tag, actually. This morning I'll be talking about observer data management undertaken by the SPC. The data collected by observers are sent to SPC by member countries on a four to six monthly basis. There are two basic options for sending data. The physical observer data workbooks, which we term as original hard copy version, may be posted or hand carried to the, to the SPC by people that travel throughout the region. Or the observer data forms are scanned into an electronic file format in the offices of member countries and then sent to SPC as attachments to email messages, on DVDs or using a choice of several internet file transmission tools. The scanning option is clearly more efficient since data can be sent on a more timely basis. There are no postage costs and the scanned data can serve as a secure archive of, of observer data for member countries' benefits. When the observer data arrives at SPC, they are registered using the SPC data registry system. Basically all data that are received at SPC are registered to ensure they can be tracked and to inform member countries that their data have been successfully received. The registration of observer data involves an established set of procedures. Firstly, the data register officer enters the basic details pertaining to the data. For example, what type of data, how much, which country was the data received from, when it was received, etc. Then, the data are printed and checked for quality since the scans are sometimes of poor quality and requests for rescanning are sent to the country. And finally, the data are prepared into suitably labelled packages ready for data entry. In regards to observer data entry, the establishment of 100% observer coverage in the Perth St. Fishery started in 2010 and has resulted in a tenfold increase in the amount of data to be entered, which will be a serious challenge for the member countries, SPC and FFA in the future. SPC has developed a database system used by a team of data control technicians dedicated to entering observer data. Observer data are by far the most comprehensive type of data collected from the tuna fisheries and it takes on average at least one day to enter the data from one observer trip. Data are entered form by form and there are comprehensive online error checking routines to ensure the data are entered correctly. Yep. There are also control totals tools which require data, data entry staff to cross check the data they enter using a calculator to ensure that both catch and length data are entered correctly. Okay. For observer data quality control, after the observer data have been entered, the data control technicians use a number of tools to continue to check the quality of the data. One of the tools is a GIS or Geographic Information System or mapping tool that shows the cruise track of the vessel with the observer on board. The data control technicians are trained to identify any unusual patterns in the track of the vessel with the observer and subsequently fix any ob obvious errors in the positional data provided by the observer. In the case shown here, a simple mistake of entering recording 8 instead of 3 was made and it is clearly shown in the cruise track. 
The data control technician goes back and corrects the positional data in the database and reprints the map to show that it has been corrected. For observer database query systems, once all the data have been entered and the quality control checking has been finished, the data are ready to be used by scientists and in the offices of member countries. SPC prepares a database query tool called Observer Trip Viewer System to be sent to each country with their observer data every three to four months. This tool allows member countries to produce tables, graphs and maps of their observer data for various purposes, including monitoring of their tuna fisheries and for inclusion of observer summaries in various reports they are required to produce both at the national and regional level. In the longer term, member countries will be able to enter their own observer data with a new observer database system which has recently been produced by the SPC.